Hello and welcome everyone. We're really excited to be here today, kicking off our, our first episode of Dissolving the Divide with Derek Bart Bartolicelli and myself, Leslie Powers. And our first guest is Brandon Spencer today. So excited to get going on this. And just for a quick um, recap of what we're here to do, Dissolving the Divide is um, a brainstorm of Derek's and um, he came to me with this idea and I had been thinking about it at the same time about how important it is for us to uh, address and dissolve all the division that's going on in the world. It's unnecessary and, you know, taking us away from our what our true focus should be, which is to um, claim our freedom, our true freedom. And the dialectics that are going on in the world today are multiple and they are divisive. So here we, we are here to have some ongoing discussions of how we can dissolve the conflict, dissolve and integrate these topics into a synthesis that will allow us to move forward in peace and harmony and freedom with a basis in truth. So with that, I'm gonna pass over to Derek so he can introduce our guest today. Yeah, Leslie, thanks so much. And uh, yeah, I'm really excited and pleased, always honored uh, to speak with Brandon because, uh, you know, him and I go way back, as far back as the headdress of uh, Mayotte and her feather, mm -hmm. which we try to live by as light within our hearts. And uh, yeah, I think uh, this segment is going to be perfect to, to delve in with Brandon because, yeah, speaking over uh, many months with him and even like getting into personal life stuff, uh, just... Mm -hmm. Yeah, just sharing, you know, some of the trials and tribulations and just better self-mastery, discipline. He's big on that. And uh, yeah, just the lessons of Mayat and this goddess and what she represents, which is why I held the tarot card of, you know, justice, um, which, you know, represents natural law. And it is that balance and finding that balance within ourself is really where it first starts off with. So, yeah, Brandon, I'll let you take it on from there, brother. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for having me on, Leslie and Derek. It is a pleasure. I enjoy the work that both of you put out. So um, I know it's going to be a wonderful you know, conversation. So I'm really you know, honored to be the first guest on your Dissolving the Divide show. So Great. Yeah. So maybe just to share a little bit about our own, our, each of our background and what brings us up to this place. Um, I'll just share a little bit. I'm a, I'm a licensed clinical social worker in the state of California. I've had my master's degree in social work and been in the field for over 30 years in a whole variety of settings. Um, and I've been delving into doing mental health counseling over the last decade with folks with complex trauma. Uh, and so there's a lot of uh, elements of divide within people, you know, and a lot of my work has been to help integrate individuals. Um, and so I think today's topic will be really exciting. Um, and Brandon, you chose the topic um, about in the internal divide, right? So Yes, yes. Yeah. And to kind of get into my background and what I do, because I've umpired um, fast pitch softball, it's been 17 years. I started like young. It's been so long. And I've traveled, you know, the country. But one thing as a umpire, one thing that I've learned is it deals with a lot of psychology because I'm constantly dealing with people. And I'm dealing with people in an, an environment that involves their kids, that involves, you know, help their children. So once things start to not go well, you know, in this environment that people kind of show their negative programming. And I've experienced it so many times is I'll get to a certain game and they'll say, oh, you know, Blue, you know, Brandon, you're our favorite umpire. And then you call their kid out and then they start screaming, oh, you're the worst umpire. And I'm like, hold on, you know, like you just say it that I was, you know, your favorite umpire. Then five minutes later, you know, you're calling me hell the worst umpire. So you're kind of... Um, so you're kind of displaying that internal, you know, division. And I started to, you know, realize this the more and more that I started to educate myself and started to do her research and started to become more knowledgeable. And the one thing that I always use that as a frame 
hell reference is to make sure that I myself am not falling for that same hell division. And then if I am, then it's up for me to help heal myself and change that because I don't want to be, you know, falling for those fallacies or, you know, falling for that dialectic. And I always use that as pretty much a way to measure, you know, you know, how myself you know, scales, you know, her weight, her measurement to make sure that I myself am not doing those same things because a lot of us will, you know, have will fall for these forms of negative programming. We'll be triggered. You know, we'll hear someone say something. We'll see a symbol. We'll see a speech. We'll see a certain uh, a certain person and then we'll lash out and we'll kind of we, and we'll kind of revert back to that childlike state that form of regression or whatever form of programming and that's what i've seen within thousands and thousands of people and thousands and thousands of interactions and i've traveled all across the country you know dealing with all sorts of individuals and i've seen this same form of internal health division within people because so many people think that the division is externally but it starts off on the internal plane because by law it can't happen on the external plane without first happening on the corresponding plane which is that internal you know realm and that's where the true how the vision happens because we hear the term divide and conquer it's divide internally then conquer externally and that's what we have seen great summary yeah yeah brandon totally uh just real quick um because i was laughing before because i could totally relate in uh yeah, you and I have been having some cool conversations about that. And I can relate because I've been a soccer referee and a baseball umpire, kind of making money on the side as a young adolescent. I didn't take it further than that. But uh, yeah, just being in that zone of neutrality and like these opposing sides and this and that. And you got folks that are, you know, they're like fair weather fans of yours, you know, in a sense, you know, like but they'll turn on you when, you know, <clears throat> like right. you said. And it's just interesting how. How people get so triggered by these and it's yeah these like tribal competitive sports and this and that it kind of you know tugs at the at that primitive part of the brain a little bit and just yeah the knee-jerk reactional type of things that that's really interesting and um yeah it's interesting also brandon when you're saying of like yeah when you're in that zone umpiring and stuff you said like you're do you want to mention that real quick if it applies to oh um yeah hell just hell when i'm in you know how the zone which hell, that's what i call it because i have to take in a lot of information and the level that i call it is a very high level it's pretty much a level a tier right underneath hell division one so a lot of the older girls who i call games for they're already committed to like top schools so they are extremely competitive so just being hell in that zone I have to, you know, be able to take in a, a lot of information fast. But then, too, hell, just making sure that I'm in that center because I've actually experimented with this for years, you know, like being kind of you know, overzealous or kind of, you know, cocky and then kind of being more toward the extremities of, you know, just kind of hell emotional and it never works out well so just making sure that i'm still balanced you know to be able to take in as much hell information to be able to process it because if i go behind the plate and i'm not feeling well or you know my emotions are getting the best of me or i'm super hell excited i'm more you know liable to miss a call and and i constantly know this because you know after doing something a thousand times you become consciously held aware of it through pattern recognition but then too i'm making sure that i'm still balanced hell enough to still be able to focus and still take in information and then too like i said earlier make sure that i myself am still you know maintaining my principles my boundaries and enforcing hell those rules and seeing like hey the way that these spectators and parents are acting, still being consciously held aware to make sure that you know i'm not going to fall for or be triggered, you know, by whatever hell they say, because, and Derek, hell, you know, when you umpire, you're going to be called everything for in the book. You're going to be threatened, um, you know, hell, you're going to be called all kinds of names, but that doesn't give you a reason to falter, you know, hell, that doesn't give you a reason to, hell, lash out and react in the same way that they are acting. So you still have to make sure that you are staying centered. You still have to make sure that you are still balanced and you still have to make sure that you are adhering to your principles and your boundaries. 
you know, because those principles and those boundaries are going to always be there. And if you don't adhere to them, then they're not really principles at all. So that's what I try to do is to make sure that I still have that mental clarity because it is a lot of mental, you know, focus um, in order to help maintain yourself because you, know, you can be worn down physically. It's hot, you know, because I'm in the South. Hell, some days it's like hell, 100 degrees and I'm wearing gear, you know, so there are a lot of things that are working not in my favor and you're sweating, you know, hell, you're ready to go, hell, you're hungry. Some days I don't get a break, but there's not an excuse, you know, so I use this as a means to build discipline for myself and to learn more hell about myself, not just on the physical level, but on the mental you know, level, too, because once someone starts to get broken hell mentally, then that's when problems start to happen. And mind you, I've been broken hell mentally sometimes too, because there have been some times where I've snapped and, you know, you know, have done some things that I possibly shouldn't have done and said some things, but I learn from those things and I make sure that it doesn't happen, you know, hell again. I will, I, that's, you've brought up so many amazing points here. I just want to um, kind of highlight a few of them. And one is, um, you know, hi highlighting that this, there's a mental process here, a mental and emotional process. And it's about how we are responding to or relating to things that are external to us that trigger us, right? So, you know, you have yourself, you're talking about wanting to stay in the center, which would be a place of, of calm, observance, right? And to be aware of yourself as something or someone is is affecting you from the external and impacting your emotion, right? And then your emotional response can make all the difference in what happens yep. next. So you could escalate the situation or de-escalate the situation or neutralize the situation. And so there's a place of power there in that response. Yep. And the, it's related a lot to re relationships with that which is outside of us. And then there's a need as far there's skills required, right, to to be able to succeed at that. One of those was you mentioned was tolerating distress and discomfort. So of being really hot, right? Or if we're hungry or we're tired, we're hot, we're cold, that's going to impact our capacity, right? To uh, and how we respond and how we are able to keep our center under pressure or stress. And I think of that center as like a place of equanimity, a place of of self energy, of 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 calm, clear, clear, you know, uh, centeredness. And then you said what I think was also really important to this conversation is about what is it that's going to guide our responses? So there's response or react, but then what is it that's going to guide that? And those are our, our principles and our boundaries. So the boundaries are partly defined by your role, right? As a, let's say, umpire, and the position you're in there and the job you're there to do, but also there's a principal aspect that might, um, that might, so to speak, trump that if it came down to it, right? Any thoughts to bounce off that? Yes, integrity. Um, you know, because the same things that I talk about in my own work, when I step on the field, I live by that, you know, so integrity is one thing that I've always talked about, you know, how being whole, um, you know, being how honest, you know, how having morals, just, you know, how those three how main principles. When I step out on that field, it's all hell about business because I am there to provide a service and I want to do the best possible, um, you know, job to provide the service. And I consider it, too, as a craft, you know, so how umpiring is something that I take very seriously because I want to get better at it and it helps me as a, a man it helps me as a individual learn more and more hell about myself so yeah hell having those principles and maintaining those um hell, hell maintaining those hell integrities are hell on the field and off the field because to me hell that is a way hell life and you shouldn't sacrifice that for anything and, you know, I've worked with so many hell, different umpires hell, off the field, you know, how to talk about it or hell, on the field, you know, how to talk about it. But then you see them kind of help contradict that and then sacrifice that. And what I always say is once we sacrifice our integrity, once we sacrifice our word and we don't hell, honor our word, then that is a little piece of ourselves that we lose. That's going to be so much harder for us to find because that little piece that is being lost 
is not making us integral. It's not making us whole because we have to be whole beings. We have to be whole balanced beings because, you know, we have the masculine, we have the feminine, uh, you know, how some people call it the subconscious and how the conscious or if you want to, you know, call it how the left uh, the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere hell regardless of what you call it is we have to have this wholeness and if it is just hell one solid it is if it is in balance then it's not going to work in your favor and ultimately it's going to do a disservice to not only you but into seeing hell the bigger picture so in that level of balance i know if i maintain to those principles and maintain to those boundaries then ultimately that's not only going to keep me safe and staying out health trouble but in the long haul hell, what i've learned i'm staying true to myself and not sacrificing anything for anyone else because at the end of the day it's not only about serving truth but it's about staying true to yourself mm, yeah great point Derek, yeah. any comments? Yeah, totally. And uh, <laughs> yeah, I love how you broke that down and staying true to yourself and uh, like seeing things just, you know, if everything is energy and like building your constitution, what is your, you know, energetic signature and how are you maintaining that and what are you magnetizing in your life or repelling <clears throat> in regards to like the law of attraction and all this? And <clears throat> as the great Manly P. Hall, uh, has said many times of just like yes when you're not staying true to your word and lying and you know and it, it comes from within you know it, it's all about one state of mind you know like where did that those ideas come from why did someone try to you know not be honest and truthful about whatever they're gonna be <clears throat> kind of uh depreciating their like magnetic energetic uh, integrity mm -hmm. in a sense. yeah i think that's a really good point that what we do even on the baseball field so to speak is it has a power that maybe we underestimate in terms of the magnetism or the impact on the environment right right and yeah. what we attract or what we repel and we could be attracting a fight you know we could be attracting chaos or we could be attracting you know and um you know focus uh, from, you know, our behavior could impact everyone on the team, right? Yes. So that brings, that me, brings us to true. the question of like, what is the value of this topic? We're talking about the internal divide. What, why is this so important? Well, how this is important because we're talking about how the self, you know, we're talking about how the individual. And when I say the self, I'm talking about how the physical, how the mental, the spiritual, the psychological and the how the emotional, not just, you know, how the physical self as what we see. But if we really want to heal things and we really, truly want to get in touch with ourselves, then we have to embrace all aspects of you know, how the self. And just like I mentioned earlier, if we are divided within ourselves, that is not being in a state of wholeness. That is not having any form of integrity. So it's important because we have to find ourselves. You know, we have to we have to understand that we are more than just Health the physical, we have to understand that we are just more than just whatever forms of egoic health attachments. We have to understand that we are just more than whatever roles you know that we play. So, in by finding your true self, then you can start to find you know your true purpose. That's what starts to give you the internal fulfillment, and that's why a lot of people in today's day are hell, walking around and kind of like this slumber you know how mindset because they haven't found them uh how they haven't found themselves they're still how divided they're you know uh they don't have any true purpose because they haven't found it so in that form of true purpose that's what gives you meaning and we all know meaning is what grants clarity and we are all looking for forms of clarity but if you are looking externally you're never really going to find it. you have to look within yourselves because there's so much on that internal journey that you can learn. And it's constantly going to be more information that's going to be going. It's like, you know, this journey is almost like it's going to take your whole life because there's always new things that you're going to be learning hell about yourself. There's always new things that you can be healed. So in, in understanding that, then you start to realize that you have the internal power. The power comes from within. And this kind of gets on uh, the video that Leslie did for the summit with Corey, you know, and how people think that uh, that power or, you know, change come from the external. 
and I forgot the uh, correct term that you use, but then you also have the people who, you know, who know that that change, that power, that willpower, that energy comes from the internal, you know, mm -hmm. because we are all a part of source. So, you know, you have to go within your own source to tap yeah. into that source, to tap into that energy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the locus of control. Yes, yeah. yeah, there we go. I love that. Yeah. Uh, I love that video, by the way. Oh, I thank you. It. Cool. Derek, you want to talk a little about why this is so important to talk about the internal divide? Yeah, sure. So, <laughs> me and growing up myself, uh, I had temper tantrums and all this stuff. I felt knee jerky about certain things. I also felt like I didn't have much of a voice just because I didn't didn't know a whole lot about. Yeah, what's going on in reality and within myself, even though I tried to stay neutral in a lot of stuff and I didn't fall for like so much indoctrination and uh, especially like bleeding heart statism of whatever flavor or color, you know, but um, <clears throat> I just, I don't know, I didn't feel like I was a true authentic person. I felt like there was something that just like I was in some kind of husk or some kind of crusty container and it like shatter it somehow in some way <laughs> and uh yeah so like the um, internal conflicts you know we always i mean what do people think it's not such a dualistic thing as well and in our first uh, chat leslie we we talked about the whole you know the congruency of our thoughts emotions and actions if our thoughts are not you know are, the, are still kind of jumbled that we're not getting our minds straight our you know emotions could be entangled in those you know uh, untrue or faulty thoughts and then our actions of what is that going to lead to and especially <laughs> brandon can speak volumes on this because he did a uh, several you know discussions and presentations about behavioralism and, and things of that nature and uh yeah I um I really think you can, that thoughts, emotions, actions being in alignment is really key to this conversation because that is an internal um, a state, an internal state, and it brings up this concept of cognitive dissonance, which describes when our internal when we have com competing or contradictory uh, internal thoughts or beliefs, and then we oftentimes people will live in ignorance of that and and it you know just sort of gloss over and not face that. And that ultimately leads to an interference in the achievement of our of our actual goals, right? So we all, I think why this is this topic, one of the reasons this topic is important is because everyone is striving to um, for some level of happiness, for some completion of goal. There's a manifestation aspect here, both in our individual lives and then for our, our our world as a whole. And when we're divided within, we create blockades and self-sabotage and we get stuck and we spin our wheels. And I know that every one of us has an area of our life where we've had a hard time breaking through and like really um, becoming all that we can be, you know, so to speak, whether it's figuring out money or stopping a bad habit. And, and what happens psychologically is that to cope with stressors and traumas throughout our life, we become compartmentalized inside of ourselves, inside of our own minds. And when we have a goal, there can be some inner saboteurs that pop up that are that were originated from some kind of a trauma. And that, that saboteur, whether it's an anxiety or a self-doubt, came from an effort for our own psyche to protect ourselves from like a perceived threat or pain. And it says, oh, hold on, hold on there. That's dangerous territory, don't go there. And then we end up turning left when we really wanna go right. And so if we're not doing the inner work and we're not really aware of our own inner contradictions and the, the, the ways that we are self-sabotaging, the way that we are triggering, getting triggered and allowing ourselves to like act out, you know, and cause chaos, then we're we're going to be stuck in our own progress. And and when we look at the whole like correspondence to what, you know, our effort to have peace and freedom in society, like if we have a bunch of people that are just reactive emotionally and not self-aware and self-sabotaging and all this, we're not going to make progress together in the direction that we really want and need to go. 
Right, right. And to kind of touch upon how what she was talking about cognitive dissonance, always use this example of if if people are familiar with, you know, how energy works and you have, um, you know, you have two different forms of energy. These energies can't harmonize if they are on two different wavelengths, if they are on two different patterns. They're actually hell will hell repel. So I always equate like cognitive dissonance is imagine your thoughts are a form of energy because technically, they, you know, how they are have forms of energy but if you have two contradictory thoughts existing on the same plane they are just going to repel and when they repel they go further and further hell away from each other and that's what leads people to polar hell extremes so if this is happening on an individual plane how can we ever you know harmonize with anybody else and create balance and create any form of a society based in freedom if we can't you know learn to have balance and you know have live internally it's never going to happen by law because you're violating, you know, how some of the core how laws of how this reality and and it's it's ignorance to the correspondence, you know, how principle, you know, if it's happening on the, if it's happening on the internal, it's, it's going to happen on the external. If it's manifesting on the, the external, then it's coming from the internal. And that's what we see. Yeah. You know, I there's also this. So we're talking about polarity, the principle also of polarity and how people tend to ping pong, you know, a ricochet, like from one extreme to the other. And that part of this dissolving the divide is finding the synthesis in this dialectic. And also recognizing that in some aspects of our life, there, there is contradiction and both can be true, right? So if you look at the, you know, the, the, the idea, let's say, of hot and cold, hot being on one end and cold on the other, there, it's all one continuum. It's all one quality of temperature, but I could be cold and you could be hot and both are true, right? So, so let's talk a little bit about how um, within ourselves, how do we negotiate contradictions and uh, things that can exist simultaneously? How do we dissolve or find centeredness uh, between poles? Oh man, hell, you've got to find a way to silence that mind chatter. You know, hell, that's what a lot of people struggle with because you know, we live in an age where there is technology, you know, there's all this information that's coming at us, you know, it's just one big, you know, hell cluster, you know, you know, fuck in a lot of people's mind because there's so much information that's coming in. We well, got to be able to, you know, sit down, you know, take some deep breaths and kind of slow things down because as long as our mindsets are, you know, being bombarded with all health information, you can't consciously keyword consciously help process it. And this is one of the things that I learned from Lennon Honor. In his earlier works, he talked about sensory overload, you know, mm. um, it, is taking in so much information that it overstimulates your senses. It overstimulates how your nervous system, then that information is transferred up to the uh, brain. And sadly, it's not really processed in the higher realms of the, the uh, neocortex because it is overstimula it is overstimulation. And then overstimulating those nerves can be harmful. So in in this over sensation or this overstimulation, we are actually going to an extreme and that's what we see is it is people taking in so much information you know have so much information it either push them in a state of fear or you know how people taking in so much uh, so much information it triggers some form of emotional health reaction and then therefore it's not a, a response so learning how to silence quiet you know have the mind in forms of meditation uh help going out in nature hell even just reading books you know you know something that is very archaic in today's day and age you know being able to silence the mind and be able to process health information at a conscious level and you know, not just being so stuck in, you know, this hamster wheel, being able to slow down things and process that information the way it should be. And hell, mind you, it's not going to happen overnight, you know, because it's going to take time. It's going to take time to consciously, truly understand something. So be be willing and be understandable that that, you know, it is a process. It's not going to happen overnight. And you have to understand that. And be patient too, you know, that 
if you do do that, if you do help do this, when you come out on the other side, it's going to be so much more beneficial for you. And that's why I've always like, you know, small forms of meditation, uh, you know, help just being able to kind of silence that mind chatter and being able to really hear that inner voice, that true inner dialogue. And it's not, you know, have that dialogue that's being bombarded by, you know, Facebook ads or, you know, you know, hell free Amazon ads. But it's that chatter right there or chatter from social media, chatter by friends or chatter from, you know, hell parental programming It's being able to silence and quiet that mind chatter. Because when you do do that, that is actually what starts to build up your corpus callosum within the mind and the corpus callosum is the part that relates health information to the left and right hemisphere held the brain and that's why health meditation had, had always been one of, of those um health processes that actually help balance that mind chatter so yeah being able to slow down how that mind chatter is one of, of the key things that people have to do because if the mind is always hell running then the physical body is going to always, you know, help be held for in the hamster wheel, because if it's happening on the internal, then that mind is going to lead our hell. Those thoughts are going to lead to an emotional reaction. And then that reaction is going to lead to a physical reaction. So, yeah, being able to silence the mind and, and slow things down to be able to process health information and the two to take in information, too. And that's what a lot of people can't really do is is they don't know how to take in right information because that mind chatter is just, you know, constantly running. It's constantly, you know, like at play. Or thoughts that like put on the brakes, right, that create resistance that all together to be open to information. Yeah, a lot of good points. Derek? Yeah, and there's a lot of inf information that people just don't want to necessarily look into because already off the bat, they'll judge a, a book by its cover and like, oh, that contradicts uh, my, you know, what I already think I know and believe and all that stuff. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, like, yeah, recentering, meditation, uh, being on the median, what is your medium of that uh, way? I mean, it's not just being in a lotus position with your hands like this, like, that's just like such a new age. Uh, image of what meditation is i mean you could just be in a meditative mind state doing anything going on a walk or, or doing whatever mm -hmm. but in being able to like have that alone quiet time try to clear the clutter out of your mind and, and silence that mind chatter like you said brennan and yeah <laughs> yeah even like deep contemplation and being able to all right stand in the center you understand you know whatever idea even you know ideas about yourself there's that one extreme and that other extreme, the two polarities, right? What is that unity? What is the the actual isness of that? Like the the wholeness of it, like you said, like being holistic about it and being in <clears throat> in touch with your intuition. And yeah, just having that, yeah, thoughts, emotions, and actions, the three tiers of the brain, neocortex, like and the limbic and then the r complex all you know kind of corresponding to the thoughts emotions and actions and like you said there's also you look at down below on the vertical scale the left and right hemispheres the masculine and feminine archetypal forms of you know that uh yeah just having those balanced especially connected to the core intelligent mind of your soul which is in the center of your chest yeah and that is really yeah. just don't yeah. even are connected to it as well or even look into and if people don't love themselves then their mind chatter and their inner dialogue isn't necessarily you know all that legit and yeah there's still things that that need to be reconciled and and ways to be uh going about that is to get into hermit mode like i have the image on the top right um and yeah being able to silence the mind and cutting off all external influences sometimes and just being able to take that journey within and you know delve down deep and do that shadow work that inner work and uh even going back to you know the childhood memories or traumas and this and that and like understanding why today there's certain behaviors and 
thought patterns that I still carry that haven't matured since I was a child and that kind of stuff. So, yeah, that self-awareness. I really, yeah. you know, I'm thinking about that part of our task is to master our energy machine, basically, you know, and uh, to tune in and attune to ourselves and to recognize how our brain works and the model of like the triune brain is really helpful that, um, you know, the frontal lobes, the, you know, the right and left hemispheres, the thinking, the human brain that allows us to do this complex thought that in how it can connect and relate to the limbic system, our emotional brain, and then our reptile brain, the brainstem, which is, you know, connect, you know, activating all the physiological responses of fight and flight or freeze. And so when we are in fight or flight, Typically, you know, the frontal lobes shut down and we don't have access to the thinking part of our brain. So what Bren Brennan's talking about in terms of meditation is really key. Some form of mindfulness or meditation practice that you do regularly so that you can take this awareness and this self attunement with you wherever you go. So if you're umpiring on the field, you have that awareness still with you of sort of your, you know, your mind, your gut and your heart sort of in alignment. And you're able to scan in like super, super rapidly to see where you stand in response to the environmental stimuli, right? And so when you catch yourself, if you're really tuning in, you catch yourself having that spark of emotion or reactivity and you can ground yourself usually with your breath, right? If we're talking about skills and how do we bring ourselves back to center, the breath is really a key anchor in that, you know, and the awareness of your body. We, we're not beings of, we, we, where our heads are cut off. We have a body and the signals of what's going on mentally are really displayed in our body. So there's like an, a, a simultaneous awareness of within and outside of ourselves. Um, and I think that we there's also an aspect here of bringing the automatic conscious, you know, where a lot of times these things are happening in split seconds before we realize it, the more that we're doing that meditative mindful practices where we're becoming aware of our, our own bodies and how our bodies respond to stress and so forth, then we become conscious of that dynamic. And it's the consciousness of it which allows us to make proper decision, you know, under moments of duress or whatever. Are those psychosomatics, by the way? Or something along those lines. Psychosomatics is a is a is kind of a, a word that doesn't entirely. It's not really use. I don't know. I don't find it super useful. It's like somatic, meaning that it's physical, but it's everything in our body is connected to our mind. It's not like se separation it doesn't really exist. But um, gotcha. but yeah, you call it psychosomatic. So that was important. And then the other thing I wanted to just to say was our, our thoughts, you know, and our attachment to outcomes. We get very attached to something being a certain way. And sometimes whether it's like a sports team, people get really attached. And, and I think it's like, it's a rep, it's a symbol of something. It represents something. So, you know, people will be like hurting other people because their team loses or because the umpire or referee makes that call, you know? Yeah. And so that's super important that we're all aware of our thoughts about the thing and the people and the outcomes we're related, relating with. Yeah. <laughs> As Leslie was saying that, you know, my mind was just going through thousands of times that's happened, you know, to me. But um, <clears throat> one thing you have to share part of that was the and one of the modalities that I've been practicing for like eight something years was conscious breathing. And what people don't realize is, is once you start to hold, if you start to hold your breath, pretty much the body starts to go through a pretty uh, a certain way of doing things as far as fight and flight. And I want to say this is something that we, a bad habit that we developed as we were young, you know, because when you cry, I was told that 
you, you know, you start to hold your breath because you can't cry either pretty much at the same time. And if you ever heard a, a, a baby crying, you hear him crying and then, and then there's that pause and then they take that breath. So conscious breathing is something that is very important because how the breath is pretty much going to help determine how your mindset too. And if you can control how your breath, you can, can how you can control your attitude and you can control how you respond to people and to the health environment. So in practicing, you know, health conscious breathing, I've, you know, held taught myself to, you know, stay balanced. And even though something is happening on the external plane, once I, you know, have become conscious that my breath changes, then I like, I know that I'm going to react to something. And this is something that I've tested too, you know, cause I've tested this stuff how many times years but i've actually realized that once my breath starts to change then i know like hey brandon you're starting to lose control you know help yourself find that center find that balance then therefore i can go through my breathing techniques because there are active breathing techniques that i practice to kind of refocus to kind of center myself so yeah i'm glad hell that you brought that conscious breathing up and <clears throat> and hell, conscious breathing is something that can be practiced at any time Hell, during the day, you can do it hell anywhere, and it's something so simple. Um, you know, hell, you do it hell, hell multiple times, and through repetition, hell, it starts to become how natural. Yeah, yeah, very true. I think yeah. it's an important practice okay. for everybody. Go ahead, Derek. Oh yeah, just um, <laughs> what you said about yeah, crying and breathing uh, reminded me of like my awakening experience, if you will, and that. Kind of felt like I got zapped by the universe or whatever it can re be relatable, like Kundalini. But what <clears throat> what I was doing, I was like, had my cosmic uh, repentance, if you will, and I was weeping for a good like twenty minutes. But as I was weeping, like, and it was intensifying so much that I was hyperventilating for like ten minutes straight, and it just couldn't stop. And like, just, my chakras were lit up, my crown was just exploding. It was it was crazy, and I've just been on a different frequency ever since. And uh, yeah, it was just me <clears throat> craving to understand so much of what I don't and making that like sweet surrender to it all in a sense, if you will. And and yeah, just uh, yearning to want to know more and connect to my higher self more and like retrieve my soul essence uh, on a multidimensional level or, or, or whatever, you know, it's a. Uh, it's not all mystic woo woo stuff. It's just I feel like there's just so much more to what we have within ourselves. And, and what about the whole fact that, you know, that was a driving factor of, you know, why I had a fire lit on my ass is like, what's the deal with uh, this rip off of life that we're, we have this junk DNA and like, we're supposedly just operating off of like 10% of the functionality, true potential of our brain or something like that. So yeah, that's like an inner conflict in and of itself, just, you know, by, and it's not by design, it's by like uh, some distortion, it seems. So yeah. yeah. And I've put out so many music mixes that talk about the mind. My moniker is Awakening Mind for that reason of the first cosmo <laughs> cosmic law principle. And I've had a lot of mixes that emphasize just like thought and all these things and taking into consideration that not all your thoughts are your own. And there's things like Watiko and things like that. And thought also means thoth. If you want to take it back to Hermes or whatever, you know, so yeah, but he ain't the bee's knees anyways. He's been exposed. But uh, anyways, don't let thought betray true, proper knowledge and wisdom. That's yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, you're bringing up this energetic point again and how we're all connected and our energetic fields overlap and can be influenced. So, you know, this symbology, you know, and mind, other mind control techniques, sound, all our weaponry or can be used as weaponry against our energetic bodies that, and we could, can carry thoughts that really didn't originate within us, but originated outside of us. So part of this self, this, this process of dissolving the divine within us is recognizing what's my thought and what is not my thought. What is the external impact on my physiology and on the potential of our of my own brain and my functioning right how did why aren't we maximizing this potential of our brain i've been 
been talking recently with several of my friends around this idea that, you know, indigenous people had this incredible like extrasensory perception where they could actually communicate like the aborigines could communicate to other tribesmen across great distances that they found water for example or or in native american story i heard this morning was that um that the coyotes spoke to this native american men and to, as to that the buffalo were like on the other side of this ridge you know Kathy O'Brien talks about how she and daughter, she and her daughter, under these states of trauma and duress, would communicate telepathically. Right. So when there's these capacities that are that we have as humans that we're not even touching upon, that is getting um, shut down. I think in by all these influences in the world. And so, wow, what is our, our potential? And and maybe we want to be more curious about that. And, and curious about um, the world and other people, you know, so that we can really uh, know ourselves complete as well as we can, as completely as we can, and maximize our p potential. Right. He'll having that curiosity, and he'll having that curiosity comes out of that divine feminine because having that curiosity means, you know, hey, you know, I'm wondering if this, you know, can be created. So we have to have that because if we don't have that, then we lose a part of ourselves because we'll never really be willing to dive into the unknown. We'll never really be willing to get out of our comfort zone. And that's what we see is so many people just want to stay in that comfort zone. They don't have that curiosity. They don't want to be creative. And also, too, I would say once you start to be creative, then you start to figure out what your true purpose is and what your true meaning is. And that's what's going to give you hell, that inspiration. And then in that creativity, you can inspire hell, the people. So in in doing, you know, you know, what we are talking about and finding yourself or going hell within yourself, there's so much that can be gained, not just from a physical level, but in the all realms, in the aspect of the self, because it was once I started to be creative, then that emotional heart based intelligence, hell, not just care and compassion, but all of those traits started to be how develop and I started to, you know, feel more purpose, more wholeness, you know, held within my being. So we've got to have that curiosity and understand, yes, you're going to, you know, how, yes, you're going to make, how you're going to make mistakes. You're going to get things uh, wrong. Hell, there may be even times where, you know, how you may follow hell the wrong person, but still have that compassion for yourself and be willing to forgive yourself to say, hey, you know, it was a mistake. Hell, no one's perfect. And don't be so hard, you know, on yourself to where you're beating yourself up, to where you're doing more harm and doing more damage. Just be willing to to have that health and passion and that forgiveness for yourself. Because if you don't have that that compassion and care for yourself, then how can you give that compassion and care to anyone else outside of yourself? Yeah. Yeah. You wanna say anything on that, Derek? Yeah, sure. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, it reminded me, uh, we had a wonderful talk uh, with the the One Great Work Warriors, with uh, Chris Jansen, mm -hmm. Jimmy, and, and uh, Crip Rick about, yeah, the the masculine and all this stuff. And yeah, it just came to mind because you mentioned, you know, that emotional intelligence and, you know, a lot of what we talked about the other week in that discussion is just like a lot of men especially in the older generations uh, they just lack that and it's just it's hard for them to even like get in touch with that as well and, and like how to even navigate or, and all these things and and yeah that's just like a one of those internal conflicts or divides in and of itself within you know a lot of people unfortunately that they're not in touch with their emotions so they're not you know they're not fully controlled obviously so yeah it's just uh, a lot of projections come af after that and voila we got like so many you know negative feedback loops you know stemming from all this stuff unfortunately you know, so yeah that in emotional intelligence i think is really what we're we're talking about here is developing that which involves a, the balanced brain and the activation and and presence of both left and right hemisphere intelligence and that masculine and feminine aspects of ourself, which we all have within us. And 
where we can get imbalanced on one extreme or the other. And when you're in one extreme, you're missing a whole perspective that's taking you away from truth, you know, the integration of truth anyway. And so being aware of how do we develop off many of us are un, you know underdeveloped in the, some of the, the feminine skills of like intuition and creative expression because the left brain is so activated by this world of technology and to-do lists and achievement and get things done so how do we you know balance that is through the the aspects of of slowing down time, right? Getting off the to-do list, off the linear thinking into a place where we can access the intuition. And I do think that things like meditation and time in nature, you know, and, you know, possibly like using some um, some plant medicines, um, there's there are things we need to do deliberately and consciously to um, balance our brain. And I think maybe talking a little bit more about, well, what are those skills and activities and things that we can do consciously to really, and we've talked about some already, but let's just, yeah. you know, expand that a little bit. What, what, it, what are our responsibilities as, as individuals to do to, to, to like sharpen our tool, to, to master our energy machine, you know, and, um, and be a whole human being? taking some time out for yourself. And this is something that I've had to learn, you know, from some feminine, you know, uh, female friends is, is taking that time for your, yourself, you know, putting that time hell aside and, and creating something, you know, um, taking something or doing something that truly brings you happiness or just getting away from the technology. Cause this is something that I did, for years is, is just sitting in a room, sitting in a, a, a chair. Hey, if, if you want to sit in front of the mirror, how that works too, but just being more comfortable in looking at yourself, being more comfortable inside your own skin. A lot of people, you know, have problems with that. If you were to put them in a, a, a room in front of a, a mirror and sit them in front of a, a chair, they wouldn't even last five minutes because hell number one, they aren't comfortable with how they look and they know that there's something inside of them that's bringing them disharmony. So we've got to learn to be comfortable in our, our own being because these are our vessels. If you're not comfortable in your own being, how are you going to be comfortable, you know, hell being in uh, hell another place, hell, hell another situation hell with someone else. So you've got to take time to help reward yourself. And this is just and hell, this is something that we weren't really taught, you know, how growing up is rewarding yourself. And I'm not talking about just, you know, like a physical reward, which, you know, at times, you know, how, you know, how that's fine. But a spiritual reward, you know, how psychological, you know, how reward learning more hell about yourself, how learning what drives you, how learning what turns you on, you know, how that's something, you know, how that you need to know, too. And then too, how learning what your weaknesses are, if there is something hell that you find that is inadequate something that you are not comfortable with then sitting in that chair sitting in front of that mirror that's your time to be honest that's your time to learn more hell about yourself this is something that i did for years and years and years you know and just sitting back you know hell i would close my eyes and just and just take in hell the information you know, through other forms of sensation and not just what I see, because mm -hmm. a lot of people are just so focused on what's in front of them that they lose sight of the other forms of senses, you know, because we can take in information from a wide variety of senses and not just, you know, have the five, you know, you have the intuitive sense, too. But just sitting in that chair and having that inner dialogue, you know, and just listen. You know, because that voice is always there. It's going to always be there. And then once you start to take in that voice, you reward yourself by listening to that voice. And then mm -hmm. if there is something that you don't like, then that's something that can be worked on. And that's something that I practice, too. If 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 there was something hell about myself, of course, it was my speech, because speech is something that I've always struggled with. It's just something that hell I was born with. Hell, I was born with some speech impediments. Most people don't hear them. But trust me, I'm consciously hell 
aware of them. So what I would do, and this is something that I learned in umpire is, is I would sit in front of the mirror and I would just talk. And then hell, something that I also would do is me and my cousin, hell, we would kind of practice and I would just turn hell, my camera on and I just got more comfortable being in front of this camera, being in front hell, hell of the screen. And after like two years, you know, you start to build that confidence. So it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's being honest and being conscious, aware. There is something about each hell of our beings that we don't like. Well, if you don't like it, I'm not saying go out, you know, and, you know, like get plastic surgery, but, you know, like get to the causal factor, you know, figure out why. And if you are capable of changing it, which, you know, how you should be able to, then change it. And that's how you have reward yourself, because I've always looked at it like this. If there is a weakness that I am aware of, you know, how with myself, then that is a way that I can be exploited by somebody else. Yes. And that's why I've always said is. We have to understand these tools of mind control. We have to understand how the psychology works. We have to understand how our psychology works, because once you understand that and once you have that knowledge, then that puts you in that position of power to create change, not just change within yourselves, but you can understand how other people's psychology works. If they are ignorant to it, then when it comes to, you know, trying to help spread this information and spread help this knowledge, you have the tools, you have the armor to fight this battle because you can read that body language. You can see how they will react to certain forms of health information. You can see the emotional you know, reaction too. Then you know, hey, if I need to pull back or you know, maybe I can be a little bit more forceful. So it's not mind influence. I'm sorry, it's not mind control. It's mind influence because that's what we are trying to do is we are not trying to change people. We're trying to influence them to to take this information in and to create change within themselves. Two completely different mm -hmm. things because you can't change anybody else, but you can influence them to do the work on themselves and take this information in and look within that mirror to create change within themselves and heal that division, heal that internal schism, heal that, you know, heal that cognitive dissonance. Yeah, it's like releasing the clasp or the, you know, that clawing desire to force or make someone do something right and backing off to that place of center and think about how do I inspire, influence, magnetize, you know, the environment or other people. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Because people yeah, will feed of, off uh, of that. <clears throat> oh, sorry. Yeah, my YouTube channel, one of the first things I wrote down as far as like what it was about is motivating minds through music. Mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. I'm not trying to control people or tell people what to do. It's just, yeah, having some kind of influence and doing on a different frequencies, melodics, lyrics. I thought that was a really cool medium of expression. And I just kind of rolled with it because I didn't have a smooth enough voice uh, to be, you know, speaking in the way that Brandon does, which I, you know, when he first told me you had a speech issue, I was like, really? Wow, man. Because he had a little thing in middle school. I went to some speech correctional therapy, or whatever. But uh, <laughs> and then living in France really helped out with that as well. But um yeah, so it's interesting, you know, I love what you had to say about everything, Ren, like, um, I totally feel you. And, um, but at the same time, I feel like there's a lot of people that feel like they're just, their shit doesn't stink. They don't need to change for anything. You know, like people are victims of uh, easy lifestyles and complacency. And even if, you know, they just get to have a partner and have sex with them and consume food and just be in a comfortable, you know, daily routine that's good enough for them you know <clears throat> unfortunately and i'm not saying that's the worst thing you know i'm not speaking bad about that but i'm just saying like there's those routines that get you know into that become negative feedback loops because you know it doesn't allocate a whole lot of time for them to you know do some self uh reflection introspection like you're saying and with all the media and stuff it's like people are would much rather go and, and do that stuff because it's entertaining and the word entertaining is to enter the mind and hold it. And we wonder who's holding it, actually, right? So, yeah. Um, and then 
yeah, those who are holding people's attentions and minds, uh, it's just created so many things throughout society. Brandon, I wanted you to kind of touch on this or ask the question of uh, as far as like, because people have these internal conflicts on as far as like what's what the external world and society kind of expects people to be or whatever and you know go through the, the main stages of life you know this american dream stuff you know get the good education get the trophy wife play the sports watch the sports or whatever get the the fancy car in, in the house after you get the big career job and all this stuff and you got the atomic family with your dog and the white picket fence and all that stuff, even though that's kind of outdated at this point, you know, but, uh, you know, there's like these expectations that people have and like, they, like you said, they beat themselves up because they can't achieve these things that are pretty unrealistic anyways. And it's just like these shit stems of the matrix that, you know, are not really something that to be, you know, valued that high of a, an achievement in living that lifestyle anyways, it's, you know, Yes. And I can, you know, talk hell about this because the way that I grew up is hell, I was in an environment in a low income area. And then fortunately, my parents moved us to an environment that was like hell middle class. And me as a kid, I didn't really quite understand it. But now that I look back on it, you know, it was a three story house, hell gated community. We had a pool in the subdivision and we had a basketball court in, in our backyard, you know, so everybody would come over and play basketball. Uh, but <clears throat> it was it was just this illusion because hell, my dad was stuck into this hell illusion. Like it's like he was loving it, you know, like he wanted to be the talk for another town. But there was all these internal problems because once you have all those big things, you have the house, you got to pay money to maintain it. You know, you got to, you got to pay someone to, to help cut the yard. It, it's, it's almost like, uh, hell, I'm going to paraphrase how the Buddhist uh, quote mm -hmm. in one of the books, but it's pretty much saying like the more material, you know, have possessions you have, then the more time, the more money you have to pay to maintain those things. Because if people aren't from, Hell, if people aren't hell aware, everything in hell, everything in manifest uh, in manifestation starts to break down. Hell, hell entropy is always hell for at play. Hell, there's gonna be dust that builds up. You know, I'm constantly trying to dust down. You know, have my computer because things are constantly breaking down into forms of chaos. So the more things that you have, you're gonna to have to maintain, and to maintain those possessions is going to take time and it's going to take money. And the time, the money, and the focus is going to take is going to pull your awareness, it's going to pull your mm -hmm. health consciousness away from the things that you should be focused on. So they give us these glamorous things, these shiny things because of course you know children like shiny things hell animals like shiny things it's what's going to be attractive to a individual who is in that low form of vibration so then you try to grasp these shiny things then once you get a hold of something you don't want to let it go and then that's what starts to feed that egoic hell attachment is once you have those things you don't want to let go because you're like hey this is mine i worked hard for it then therefore you almost kind of have that child mentality this is mine this is mine this is mine you know right yep yeah, and you don't want to let go and then anyone who brings hell information you know, saying, hey, maybe you should let this go. How do you react? You will use forms of slander. You will use forms of verbal and even get physical because you have built up that egoic hell, you know, hell attachment. And that's why they tell us, hey, you got to have this big house. You know, hey, you got to have, you know, hell, this uh, hell, this Tesla or, you know, hell, this Mercedes. Hey, you got to have, you know, hell, three kids and, you know, hell, work this nine to five slave job because they are putting out forms of wrong information and we all know that forms of wrong how wrong information is going to lead to wrong forms of behavior and that's what we see is everyone's trying to lash out for this dream but they're never really going to catch it and yeah, the ones it? who do if you talk to them they are actually in a a, 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 a bad mindset because they are suffering Yes, and afraid of losing that comfort, like you said, so invested in um, losing what they've gained or maybe having money now and having the opportunity to like do a lot of pleasurable things, travel and, you know, take cruises and do this and that. And 
And I yeah. think it's like the trick, again, it's like putting people in this, this divide, this dialectic of polarity, playing with our desire to have a balance. But so you work really hard, you know, you're very goal driven, very masculine, then you have this time off or this money, and then you get to do the feminine in extreme. And a lot of the, I think a lot of the material, um, those little carrots that we're chasing, it's almost like the fake uh, feminine that we seek, the false feminine. It's shiny, these shiny things like and the feminine is, you know, is kind of like beauty and comfort and you know, being able to luxuriate on some level, there's nothing wrong with that. But but it's like, what is the true natural feminine way of being, right? As, And they're tricking us with these other shiny objects that we're going after in a way. I, I just had that thought. But I was thinking about, you know, the pain point and how people get kind of trapped. And like you were saying, Brandon, that the material world de, de uh, what would you say it like it breaks down yeah, and so do our down. bodies our bodies break down and it leads to a pretty uh difficult like internal uh dissonance or di internal uh, discomfort around our bodies and pain and what is a great motivator but our pain whether it's emotional or physical and so i think that that is an inroad for people is our everyone has a pain point and that that is where you know even when they're attempting to find happiness through all these material things and food and comfort and what you know being safe on their couch you know with their popcorn watching tv or whatever it's an attempt there's ultimately going to be a, a pain that results many people are experiencing disease and physical pain. And so where, wherever anyone is at, it's like looking to that place where you're trying really hard to be okay and feel okay, but it's just not working, you know? And people tend to, you know, keep trying over and over and over again, knocking on the same door and it just doesn't work, right? We have to wake up and say, wait a minute, this isn't working. Let's go within and let's figure out why I'm experiencing this pain. You know, why as humanity are we experiencing this pain and yeah. gain wisdom, different knowledge and understanding to be more wise in our choices. Um, and I do think that the body work being so part of building this feminine, the proper feminine, you know, is 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 embracing how our bodies work and listening to our body developing a harmonious relationship with our body and the wisdom of nature expressed through it and that has a lot to do with food and sleep and balance and breathing and grounding so we can use our bodies as an inroad to balance our mind through you know, scanning our body and noticing where the tension is, breathing into our body, into our pain, grounding ourselves through our senses. Like you said, Brandon, not only what you see, really see, but seeing everything around you in new ways, like it's brand new and listening to the sounds and touching and really feeling like your feet on the ground where you know right now and what does that connection feel like and the parts of your body touching the chair and noticing the temperature of the air and the textures you know of things around you we have we can gain our centeredness a lot through our connection to our human form in the material world and then learning about how it operates and honoring it. There's a certain element here, I think, of honoring our um, our imper impermanence, yeah. but also understanding we have amazing technology here that we can, if we treat it right, if we learn how we work, we have amazing potential. You know, imagine the guys who really are into cars and they know how everything works inside and outside of a car. Well, let's all we all have the capacity to understand our own selves that way. So we can drive optimally, right? 
Yes. Man, you said that so how beautifully. Like mm-hmm. like I'm just imagine, you know, you know, how this stuff in my mind. And yeah, um how listening to the uh, body, um, how this is something that how Corey Andrelet how talks about um, you know, hell, because all of our bodies are going to be different, but you have to have this conscious realization to listen to, you know, your body because your body has an intelligence of its own. And then also, too, trauma can be stored, hell, in certain parts, hell, you know, hell of the body. So, hell, listening to that, and that's something that I had to learn uh, because, hell, through repetition, hell, through, you know, hell, conscious realization, you can start to, you know, hell, hell, know certain patterns, hell, within the body and it's like helping me i know once the weekend comes my body starts to react you know how differently because i'm preparing myself how not just mentally but physically that pretty much i'm going into a war zone for at work because i have to deal with certain things and during the week you know how my body how reacts certain uh you know, help a certain way. But once Friday comes, even if I'm not working, I am aware that my body still will go through, you know, hell, this certain way of doing things because hell, the body has its own, uh, hell, it has its own form of hell intelligence too. So through hell repetition, my body has become hell accustomed because I've kind of been on the same pattern for 17 years and it, hell, it will change up. But if I am working, I'm pretty much busy the whole weekend. So from 4.30 in the morning, sometimes up to midnight, hell, I'm on my feet. So, yeah, I know Derek's like, oh, man, yeah. It's a lot of physical stress. But then, too, that's how I've learned to to build discipline, you know, how physically, you know, to help kind of, you know, help strengthen my legs, help strengthen, you know, have my arms. But, too, it's the mental discipline. So being hell aware and listening to the body and, and not – Hell, ignoring it because if you ignore it, that's only going to make things worse. You know, it's like you know how people have said: if you ignore certain symptoms, then those symptoms are only going to get worse. So you know, hell, pay attention to that and then shine light on that. You know, hell, get that proper diagnosis because in in having that knowledge, that's what puts you in a position of power. And you see, hell, people say hell, knowledge and ignorance are you know are the opposites. How I would say knowledge and fear because it's the people who are in fear you know then they stay in ignorance but once you have that knowledge that's what dispels that fear yeah yeah gnosis dia gnosis the way to knowledge and uh diet is just a way of life and uh how are people's diets really and how do people really understand the gut brain connection it's like 70 percent and what are they actually consuming you know, the contradictions within that and hey, <clears throat> I mean, I try to eat healthy and I'm like pretty much like vegan, even though I don't like the word, whatever. But uh, <clears throat> I still can eat like, you know, some potato chips, whatever, or, you know, have a beer sometimes. But uh, it's all about, you know, stacking up all the negatives and the minuses and also understanding like mucus forming foods or acidic foods versus alkaline or just healthy foods and like mm-hmm. all that stuff. It's, you know, listen to your body as we're all saying and, you know, find that what works for you and what you should be consuming in more moderation and understanding like everything that you consume is the totality of your being. So, you know, when everything is considered, you know, how are you looking yourself in the mirror? <clears throat> you know, like that's a, <laughs> It's a good way to, but you know, how many things are people considering? And, and you know, there's so much to consider. And it's just a, a shame that, you know, we weren't really taught either from family or school or educate, whatever, you know, growing up of how to, how to do this, how to properly learn what's a, a good way to have that teachability, how to properly think, you know, like, you know, how to cultivate good thoughts. And uh, <laughs> reminds me of a, video i did is called yeah planting proper seeds in your alchemical garden or something like that and you know mm-hmm. like just like how are you tending to the fires within but also you know your mental landscape and, and is it properly watered is it you know you got the winds of chaos blowing around too much are you able to have a nice subtle thing and like even like yeah you're thinking about things and you're trying to understand why you're triggered by certain things or why certain emotions arise from whatever 
And are you able to kind of step aside from that in that neutral position and be the objective observer that allows you to suspend all your, you know, emotional hangups and, and mental hangups as well regarding, you know, certain things about anything, yourself, uh, other people, you know, life, government, whatever. <laughs> yeah. There's not a, a true divide between our minds and our bodies, right? They're very interconnected and all one, even though there's an appearance of separateness again, but we're in a, we have an integrated system. And so attending to all aspects of mind and body and spirit is really important for the optimal functioning of our awareness and our consciousness, right? To be able to read the environment and process information and um, come to conclusions that then lead to our actions in the world. So we want to have a pure, a pure, um, you know, as I think of it as like a, a clean machine, right? As in, in our food and, and diet have a lot to do that. And we're all individual too, in that, you know, my optimal diet may be different than yours. And the answer isn't going to come from some, you know, nutrition guru or MD. Really, it's about that inner knowledge and learning about our own systems. So I really want, want to promote people so much more to recognize that you can become your own on like expert of yourself and know what you need. You don't have to make an appointment necessarily and go ask somebody who's got a very limited uh, amount of training and knowledge and have restrictions from government licensing boards to tell them what they can and can't tell you, you know? So part of this empowerment and dissolving the divide, well, part of dividing, dissolving the divide is our empowerment through self-knowledge. Yes, this whole one shoe fits all, you know, you know, health propaganda that a lot of the health mainstream, health governmental institutions, you know, spew out. If if one shoe fits all, then it kind of takes away, you know, the whole point of being a individual. It takes away, you know, health, all health, of those health aspects of health, each and every one of us. So to me, it's just another form of health collectivism and, you know, health throwing everybody into the yeah. same pot. Um, what works for me may not work for you. So you kind of have to, you you have to use discernment. You have to help experiment. And, and, and that's what we are trying to, you know, help encourage people to do is, is you have to experiment, you know, help with yourself, experiment, you know, help with these things. Hell, meditation may not work for you, you know, hell, uh, hell, my diet may not work for you. Okay, well, you know, hell, listen to your body, hell, listen to, you know, you know, have the inner dialogue, and then you have to make that discernment. You have to make that choice. Don't rely on anybody else. You know, listen to that heart-based, you know, hell intelligence, and then that right there should be that guiding factor. If your body is telling you one thing, then don't ignore it. You need to listen to it, and you have to experiment. It's going to take time, and a lot of people who want that instant gratification, you know, you know, how they want you know, have results now, you know, it's like, no, it's not going to happen, you know, mm -hmm. because if your body is telling you something now, then yeah, but you know, usually if that's happening, then it's not going to be going in a positive way, because if you are living a form of toxicity, you still have to understand that once you change something that the body has become hell accustomed to for so long, there's always going to be negative consequences for that, because you have to pretty much weed out that toxicity, you know, it's just like, you know, hell, if someone is trying to reprogram, you know, have themselves, you have to get rid of them, hell, of the bad forms of thought, those bad forms of information, those narrow pathways that have already, you know, been paved. You got to deconstruct and break those neural pathways down in order for something to be built you can't build yeah. on top of something that is toxic because yeah. that toxicity is going to be that that foundation so then therefore that toxicity is not going to be able to coexist on something that is not toxic so yeah. that's why hell we're saying is you have to take away or break down what is already there and it kind of gets into the hell what i said earlier about hell energy if if that toxicity is on one plane and then you try to bring in new form of information that is not toxic, that is another form of energy, they're not going to coexist. So you have to take away and break down those you know, boundaries that are negative, 
that information, those thought forms, those beliefs, yeah. those patterns, those worldviews, because a lot of people yeah. have negative worldviews, those negative ways you see yourself, those negative ways uh, are those negative, you know, uh, uh, things you're putting into your body. You got to break all that down and be willing to let that go and just throw your hands up to the all, the isness, you know, the universe and say, you know, I am in service to you. You know, sometimes that's what you got to do is just throw your hands up, you know, you know, to the heavens, you know, even if you are religious or not, it's still the heavens, you know, have the all, have the isness, you know, have source and just throw your hands up and, and just say, you know, like, hey, I am in service to you. And then hell, once you do that, then hell, the information should be coming. Hell, the energy, hell, the energy should be coming. So, yeah, you got to learn yeah, to man, that shit go sometimes. Right. <laughs> I just got to say something real quick because, uh, uh, like yeah, detoxification. We we can do this in so many different ways, and yeah, digital detox is great, especially it's gonna untangle like this hardwired brain that's so addicted to all this, you know, dopamine hits of screen time and, and this and that. And uh, to rebuild one's foundation, I mean, like everything you said, like the totality. It's like you know, just clear that you know that gunk so you can you know establish something on some solid ground is like something like a vision quest where you're out in nature you ain't got no tech it's a digital detox as well as like a food detox and all you're doing is drinking water and you're out in nature and you, you pitch a tent and that there you go good luck <laughs> you get your little hatchet like that one guy in the movie or uh, now that tv show not pff, tv show um and i know the guy's name too but it's the book yeah but anyways, um, <laughs> hatchet, you know that one? But uh, yeah, just for me, I've, I've done so many, de I've detoxed and not, or fasted, uh, Master Lemon Cleanse, by the way, for over 100 days in my entire life. And that has helped me nice. uh, practice so much in so many different types of discipline and mental, physical, and all these things. And Leslie, I liked what you mentioned uh, as far as like bringing up pain, because pain is one of those, it's one of the biggest catalysts that a lot of people are, yeah, the biggest and probably the most common for people to actually, you know, it kind of like crashes their paradigm and they really have to make a change. Otherwise, you know, they're doomed in a sense. And it's unfortunate that it they couldn't change before leading up to that point And it got that bad almost, you know, and so like having discussions like this and, and like things that we've learned over the years, it's like, yeah, we're trying to avoid that for ourselves and other people as well and like we see the collective trajectory and you know it's kind of like we're <laughs> gonna go smack uh, in a brick wall going how many miles per hour but uh yeah 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 that i love that idea of it's really important of detoxing and removing that the obstacles and the stagnancy and the uh, barriers the toxicities in our bodies and in our minds right and to then from that place be in, in the place of stillness to receive information, to listen, to listen internally as well as like spiritually. And from there, rebuild very consciously. And, you know, Derek, you brought up this metaphor of like building a shelter. And I was thinking, yeah, it's like we then take res need to take responsibility for building our internal mechanisms to protect ourselves, to to um, master, to develop the skills to be ma master of our lives. And that could include an inner shelter. You know, we have to have filters that we are conscious of putting up at times, like from overstimulation in the world and habits. We create habits and routines very consciously instead of knee-jerk reactive to pain or discomfort where we're just sort of like, you know, flopping around according to external, you know, stimulation. One, one of my kind of biggest wake up, mo you know, times was when I just realized that I was sort of just blowing in the wind. I was just, my life was going so fast that I had lost touch with my own self-driven trajectory, you know, and I was just reacting, I was surviving and I was reacting to, to the environment. And it took like ha having a baby, <laughs> you know, and having time off to realize how the hell did I end up with this baby? Like, right when I'm trying to like end a relationship and you know what happened to my dreams and my goals and like what am i doing and you know sometimes it takes that that like our lives get out of 
control and we are stuck like, how the hell did I get here? You know, it reminds me of that um, Talking Heads sound, song, you know, where he says, how did I get here in this, in this house with this beautiful wife? <laughs> I'm like, I don't even know, right? Do we create our, our own lives? And, and that's often when we wake up is when we realize, damn, you know, I need to take some more control over this trajectory that I'm on and take responsibility for how I got here and develop both the internal and external boundaries, you know, to, to like, like if I'm on a horse, I need to guide that horse. And, you know, we need to take care of the horse and take care of ourselves and the carriage we're in and, you know, all of these metaphors along the way. Right. Because taking control means you have to be centered and have balance, because if you wanted to build a house, you know, and you wanted to pick up a hammer, start, you know, putting in some nails, if your left hand and her right hand was in there fighting with each other, you wouldn't be able to get much done. So in order for us to take control, we have to build that inner control and build that inner balance because that's where the true power lies. And uh, if people aren't familiar, you know, with my presentation that I did at the Freedom Mother Natural Law 2 conference, I kind of talked about, you know, the whole thoughts, hell emotions and the actions, the mystery of the heart, mind and hands and how we need to have that balance we need to have that hell internal balance because we see so many people that are abusing you know hell using these hands for the wrong you know reasons and they are using forms of violence they're using forms of hell manipulation and what they are constructing what they are building is a prison and if you was to ask them like hey do you want to be ruled by someone else? Hey, do you want to be controlled by someone else? They would say no, hell no. I've actually asked this to, uh, hell, I've asked this to people, but then yet their hands, their deeds, their behaviors are doing the complete opposite of what they just said and what they think. So we've got to find a way to build that internal control that internal yeah. balance and feel comfortable with ourselves and then to love ourselves. Hell, this yeah. was something that I had to admit to myself a few months ago. Um, and, you know, shout out to Mario West, because when I was watching one of her videos, it just it just dawned on me, you know, because she said something, you know, to the fact like you can't love someone else if you don't have love for yourself. And then, it, yeah, <laughs> and then there was something that uh, hell, something that I told myself possibly one of the first times that I remember is like, hey, I love myself, you know, hey, I feel comfortable, you know, you know, you know, with myself. So just emitting those words created so much of a your energy held with inside me yeah. that it gave me that fulfillment. It gave me more of a your purpose. So, yeah, hell, shout out to her. <laughs> yeah. Self-love really is a root, right, yeah. that we need to have as a foundation to then um, be in integrity too. Like it comes back to integrity and alignment of thoughts, feelings, actions, mind, body, spirit. And when we're out of alignment, when we're filled with all this dissonance and contra internal contradiction, then generally we're not gonna feel really good about ourselves or we have unresolved traumas that, you know, are leading to different behavioral outcomes and acting out and reactions and so forth we're not feeling good about ourselves that core of shame that people often struggle with so there's this self-love and then i was thinking about again this aspect of integrity related to principle because we have to have some kind of a structure that guides us both internal structure and external structure of action and that really comes back to natural law and understanding cause and effect, understanding the hermetic principles and being aligned to principle so that when we're at a crossroads and every day, many times during each day, we come to a crossroad where we have a choice. Our life is filled with the eternal number of choices and we have agency over those choices and how we think, feel, act. And that is the, the path of, of integrity that can keep us focused through principle. Maybe share a little bit about that and how it relates to the internal, internal um, divide. Yes. Um, 
I'm going to kind of use a lot of symbolic, esoteric, you know, to kind of help relate this message. But if you understand the concept of darkness, you know, ignorance, you know, evilness, hell chaos, a lot of people say that this world is ruled by, you know, some form of darkness. So, you know, we have to have that beacon of light. We have we have to have that torch, you know, and I've always I've always symbolized this torch, you know, as a representation of light, of truth. And then also, too, of principles, because like Leslie just said, there's going to be that fork in the road sometimes, you know, so sometimes we may have to make a decision. But what are you going to make your decision based off of? If you're going to just make your decision based off some form of egoic hell attachment, some form of emotional reaction, then sadly, it's it's possibly going to be held the wrong choice. But if you have that foundation of hardcore firm principles, firm principles, you know, then when it comes to that decision making as far as choices, then that's what's going to be that beacon of light in order to guide you in the moments of darkness. And mind you, <clears throat> we've all gone through moments of darkness in the past, you know, you know, a few years. It was those principles, those core boundaries, which helped guide us, which helped us stay true to ourselves. When we saw so many people held around us, sacrificing those principles, sacrificing a pieces of their self to go along, you know, how to get along. And then, you know, how it was in that moment, those principles are what we clutched on to. You see, it's OK to clutch on and hold on to your principles. That's completely different than, you know, clutching on to some form of egoic attachment or materialism, because those principles are a part of you. Those are the boundaries. That's what's going to make up as for uh, help make you up when it comes to building. And hell, like I've said, if you want to create anything with anyone, you have to have some form of foundation because, you know, you, you have to communicate. If you are not on the same set of principles, then how are you truly going to communicate and build something that's going to be long lasting? You see, we are trying to build something that is going to be long lasting. We're not looking for, you know, you know, little small time, short term form of freedom. We're talking about real freedom. We're not talking about freedom for a few years. We're talking about, you know, something that is long lasting in longevity. So we've got to have those principles right there because trying to build something on a rocky foundation, on sand, on something that's not going to sustain itself is not going to work. And we've seen this happen so many times, you know, people trying to build things, you know, people trying to communicate, people trying to build groups. Well, that's totally fine. But if y'all don't have those same set of core principles, how are you ever going to communicate? How are you ever really going to build something? It's not going to work because you're not because you don't really know what this person's true purpose is, true goal is. So if you do have those set of core principles, then that's what's going to build that connection. And because then you can build that connection with somebody else, you because you have that connection with yourself. So those principles are going to be that beacon of light in forms of darkness those principles along with the truth are going to be what guides you because that's what's going to be what guides you to doing right action and that's why the principles of how natural law have to be understood hell knowing how was right hell and wrong so yeah. when times get dark then you know how what you are going to clutch on to and it's not going to be you know how your bank account it's not going to be you know how you trying to go out and get more booty as people call it <laughs> but you're going to hold on to your principles because that's going to be that light that's going to be that torch that's going to be your candle in forms of darkness to guide you on your own journey to guide you on your own path Really well said. Thanks, Brandon. Yeah, yeah and uh, we're about an hour and a half into it. Um, Final words. Like, to, I mean, that was like, <laughs> we could conclude that in and of itself. And yeah, it was so wonderful. And, and yeah, like we can end this episode. I would maybe have to do another one with you or someone else. But uh, yeah, ending this with first things, you know, that's what principles are and the values and like, we're talking about eternal principles, non-man-made principles and things that we can just align to. And like Leslie and I were talking about in the first discussion of the science of life. And, you know, Corey Andrelit calls it naturosophy, which is I like that term as well. The naturality, natural law, 
all these things. And like, yeah, finding that unity consciousness within ourselves, we're going to take it back to the internal conflicts and division within oneself and not understanding that, yeah, those two pillars of enlightenment or just the two set hemispheres of the brain, the masculine and feminine, and those sacred principles therein, as, as far as, you know, the self-defense principle, the masculine, and the, the non-aggression, non-violent principle of the feminine, and how that plays out in that dynamic within oneself. And are they having non-violent communication within themselves, you know? Are they upholding, you know, the the their constitution with of their in, individual self you know above you know all the minutiae out there or distorted you know views of you know one's true authentic self from the external you know yeah i i would just like to leave people with this invitation is to just look at your own self in terms of your alignment of thoughts feelings and actions and relate that to principles, the first principles. And there's a whole lot of growth and healing that can happen from that process. Yeah, it's been a great conversation. Yeah, thank yes, you so I, much. Uh, yes, and yeah, thank you for having me on. And how my closing words, it kind of how reminds me of the meme, how the person how acts who wants to change the world, then, then everyone you know raises their hand, so then, the next question is, well, who is willing to change themselves and how no one holds up their hand? So that's really what we are trying to inspire, you know, people to do is is look in the mirror. Start with yourself, you know, hell, figure out, you know, how can you become a better individual? If it's a, a better husband, a, a better wife, you know, that's something that you have to you have to decide for yourself. Start looking in the uh, mirror because too many people want to point their finger out toward you know, other people, but you really have to do this and start pointing it here. You know, it all starts ends, you know, with the self. So how that's going to be my closing words right there. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Brandon, um, you've done some phenomenal work over the past couple of years and yeah, you showed me the ropes yesterday on your beautiful studio setup, and this man's invested like countless hours and money in regards to, you know, what you're, you know, have built up a, a day already from a wonderful foundation <clears throat> and um i know you got a lot of natural law and all that good stuff and uh can you please tell the wonderful folks out there still listening where they can find you especially since youtube loves you so much they have to you know keep you far away <laughs> oh yeah and, man. Uh, yeah just what have you been up to maybe highlight some of the most recent works you mentioned yeah the the conference as well i love your lex naturalis uh, presentation as well and mayad versus ishvet is great as well which is why i wanted to have a chat with you to begin with and and, and uh yeah yeah it's all you brother thank you for those kind of words yeah people can find me on odyssey her odyssey is pretty much my main platform how right now uh, I'm going to be in the works of, you know, creating my own, you know, website and trying to get my, uh, you know, hell content uploaded on hell the platforms. Of course, you can find me on the One Great Work Hell Network. You can find me on BitChute. I do have a YouTube channel, but I don't advocate anybody hell watch those videos because YouTube is not worth the time in my you know view and it's just straight garbage since i'm on my third channel but yeah that's where people can find me and right now i'm working on a, a presentation which derek kind of got to see some behind the scenes photos uh it's going to be titled why natural law is not is not a religion so uh yeah, it, yeah it should be out possibly the end the end of this week it's about 95 percent done you know so oh and then also i've done a few group chats along with chris jansen uh crip rick uh jim and uh jerry you know have they a part of a, a group that i am in that uh that that was created by chris jansen and our first video was what is a right so we kind of wanted to start off with a quick you know quick foundation because a lot of people think they know what rights are but they don't so just kind of starting simple and a basic and then we had a second video which derek you know joined us and i'm sure we're going to have a, 
a, a second uh, part to it to where we talked about what is a, a man because you see a lot of videos you see you see a, a lot of males who are you know you know hell regurgitating oh a male should be i'm sorry a, a man should be a, a alpha male or a, a sigma male but none of them ever really talk about going within themselves none of them ever really talked about getting in touch you know hell with the feminine none of them really even talking about being honest and maintaining your world i'm sorry help maintaining your word so hmm. we was just you know trying to talk about what are some of the real aspects of being a, a man so yeah i'm sure there's going to be a, a part two help coming up soon because we would like to get a lot of you know great feminine wisdom you know on mm -hmm. that topic so cool yeah yeah and my work my website is live thrive life and i have a uh, an odyssey channel as well and i'm on the one great work network i also have a youtube channel but within like the first day they deleted my corruption of care presentation so yeah. <laughs> you can't find that there um so yeah odyssey one great work network and my website um are probably the best ways to get to my work and i'm really excited to start this project here with derek and Got a lot of ideas so keep checking in on our divide or dissolving the divide <laughs> yeah most definitely thank you so much everyone who tuned in and yeah much love and respect to brandon our guest today much love and respect to, to leslie as well and uh yeah all the links for everyone's work is in the show notes description as usual and um i'm gonna think of you know some little reference <clears throat> or you know learning tool as well and brandon if you wanted to leave any links to specific uh videos that are really relevant to what we discussed today i mean you touched on a lot of stuff anyways and uh yeah just uh thank you again i got nothing else to say my works are where they're at <laughs> you can find them on on screw tube and honesty and bit and all that so yeah Awaken your Can mind. I end it with a, a quote. Yeah. Yes, please. And uh, you know, thank you for inviting me on. But yeah, hell, the quote is by Manly P. Hall, and it is: "No one should have to be untrue to their self in order to be true to hell another." Yeah. Great Word. quote. <laughs> well, yeah, Brandon, thanks again. Thank you, Manly, the great granddaddy of a. <laughs> The yeah. modern day philosophy and mystic and natural law good stuff. So yeah. <laughs> Thanks again. Yeah. Thanks out there. Take care everybody. Thank you for listening. Peace out. You've got to take it deeper into the art and science. You must know thyself and you must know your own psychology. You must know your own mechanics. You must know your own unique trajectory. It is time to take your power back. It is time to take your mind back. When Thoth, which literally means thought, betrayed wisdom, that is when all of this happened. And lastly, when your thought is not in alignment with proper knowledge and wisdom and truth, you are caught in all of the nets, traps, and snares set up by the House of the Nets. So know it.